Your attention, please. Paul and Alex are required to proceed to the gate immediately. What? No way. What is happening here? This is the last call for the Layovers podcast. Really? Come on, man. This is our thing. We got this. Oh, yeah. And we made it. Of course, geeks. Flight 71 to Taipei. 71. Gosh, I can't believe we've done 71 episodes. I can't believe people are still listening. (laughs) (laughs) To our nonsense every two weeks. Guys, we're recording today. I'm going to start off right without uh, April 24th. Kind of very close to the last recording, just because, like we said at the end of the recording last time, we are both traveling quite intensively. And we said, okay, you know what? We have a chance to do that. Let's record. However, that also means that this will not go on air before a few days. So maybe half the show will be wrong by then. <laughs> that's, and that's the funny thing is that the world of aviation and airlines seems to be moving very quickly at the moment. There's lots of uh, things where we say, oh, we'll never hear about that again. And then we go to air and <laughs> it's, it's completely wrong and the world's turned upside down. But that's nice. That means we can keep doing this. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Uh, Taipei, man. I wasn't expecting to fall in love so hard with that place. Breathtaking. You have to do it. I've heard nothing but good things about it in the last, I don't know, five to 10 years. People have been raving about it. I've been to the airport, but I have never been to the city itself. And when we were researching the attache book, everything I read, all the pictures that we commissioned, they were just, everything just looked great. And then hearing your enthusiastic uh, field reports during your trip, it was just like, okay, I need to get here. You know, a lot of people say it's a hidden gem, and it actually is. It's not a place that would have ranked, you know, into like my must-dos. The proof is that I hadn't done it since. Well, yeah, I used yeah, to live yeah. in Asia, and it was next door, and I didn't go, right? I know it's going to be a bit cliche what I'm going to say, but it's really that fantastic mix between Japan and China. Mm. You find a little bit of Japan, a little bit of Tokyo, a little bit of Osaka, and you find a little bit of China as well, a little bit of Hong Kong, a little bit of Shanghai, in terms of the food, the culture, the way people behave. There's there's something really energetic about that city. I mean, I have friends of mine who live there, who used to live there, were born there. They tell me that's changed a lot, so I cannot judge it how it used to be. But definitely, I'm going back. I might even go back this year because I loved it so much. It was wow. fantastic. Yeah, You have to listen to Attaché to learn about cities, not this show we're talking about, <laughs> airports and airline. So I'm not going to dwell on it, but it's really fantastic. I loved it so, so much. I absolutely need to go back. It's my newfound love in in, in Asia. Um, Talking about newfound love, we had uh, two reviews to start with that that were very kind on iTunes. Guys, it's always so nice of you to to do that because not only it helps us getting new listeners, and we actually are getting, I see the numbers, but simply because you're taking the time to do so. And that's actually very, very kind of you guys. Absolutely. Thank you. The first one is from uh, the US, (laughs) Briley275733. I guess that's not your date of birth. (laughs) (laughs) Love the podcast, guys. Really scratches that itch to fly when I'm in between trips. Great production quality, too. I swear you guys were recording in the same room every episode. Well... For those who are long-time listeners, for those who go into these marathons and listening to every episode since the beginning, you can see the improvement, especially at the beginning. Yeah. We almost nailed it. I mean, sometimes we still have a few glitches, but I think we almost nailed it. Yeah, I think we're constantly tinkering, yeah. as you have to do. There's no there's no bulletproof template here, but, but thank you for saying that. And the funny thing is, we've only ever recorded in the same room once. And it was a disaster. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was an absolute. Since then, actually, I've learned how to do that because I produce two other podcasts, one of which everything is recorded on site. And I've actually now figured out how to do it. So one day with Alex, we might actually be in the same room and do one live with maybe guests or whatever. But for the moment, it's just so easy to do it like this. Yeah. The flip side is sometimes it limits the number of episodes because we don't carry the entire equipment when we're traveling. And also right. we're not sure about the, the quality of the broadband when we're traveling. Very true. 
The second one is uh, entitled Looking Forward to Every New Episode. That's from uh, Rico Weider from Switzerland. Actually, I know him. He used to live in Singapore. Uh, Rico, I'm going to Singapore. It's too bad you're not going to be there. I remember our very good times like going in all the hotel bars together. Oh, nice. <laughs> He's the one who made me discover the one altitude, altitude one, I remember, which is one of the rooftops yes. in downtown core, which is very, very nice. Uh, Rico says, I've been listening to this podcast from the beginning, and I enjoyed every single episode so far. Are always happy whenever there is a new one available. It's a pleasure listening to the two hosts chat away about aviation. Keep it up. Thank you, Rick. No, thanks really a lot. Really that's, that's really nice. Uh, we have an answer about our pizza thing. Uh, uh, Michael at Do Not Call Me Mike on Twitter said that Turkish Airlines Lounge at Istanbul does pizza. Of course. Why did you not think about that? This is one of the most massive lounges in Europe, and they do pizza, apparently. That's very cool. Yes, this is perpetual quest to find pizza in lounges. <laughs> <laughs> and now we found what we have to keep some kind of spreadsheet going. Well, for the moment, there's one line. But it will grow. <laughs> So, yeah, and I hope that when they actually are moving to the new airport at the end of October, I mean, I still cannot believe they're going to do that, not because I do not trust them to do it, but because when simply you look at the pictures of the current state of yeah. this new airport, you're like, can it not be ready in a few months? Yeah. But I hope that they keep the pizza thing because that, that would be really lovely. And, and like, as I said many episodes ago, I would love to fly Turkish slightly more because for me, the bottleneck is uh, at the Turk, the airport. Layovers there are always super super stressful you're mm-hmm. not sure you're going to make your connection and it's a uh, although the lounge is really cool it's, yeah absolutely one other thing that happened to us is that <laughs> so i retweeted a piece of news which is a redeeming point for united was the statistics of how many women pilots yes, yeah. each airline had and although the numbers are very low sadly uh, united is by far the airline that has the more female pilots so that's great i think it was seven percent i don't know the, the numbers in front Se- of me only seven percent yeah, exactly. That's really low. I mean, you, you can see, I think Jeez. Emirates was almost at the bottom. There was a few worse airlines. So there was like a lot in the middle there. But I think that, w- that was it. It was between 1% and 7%, which wow. is still, you know, I hope more women pilots will come. And we'll come to that actually later on, obviously, about that Southwest flight we'll, we'll talk about, obviously, in this episode. So, yeah, the funny thing is I retweeted that. And right after... Now we have a new follower on our Twitter account, which is United Pilots. So basically the union for Pilots United. So guys, do not listen to all the episodes before because we keep not always being nice (laughs) with United. (laughs) Well, that's nice that they followed us. So welcome, United Pilots. Uh, The other thing that I forgot to mention, again, about the pets policy, and I'm really sorry because I forgot who told me that. It's one of our listeners. Please flag me and send us a, a Twitter DM or Facebook message or an email. You remember I said that United had a higher death rate of pets compared to the other yeah. American Airlines. And that person told me something very interesting, told me that actually United is the only airline in the U.S. that accepts pets, especially dogs, that have a higher rate of uh, potential death. So like they are more at risk. You know, some dogs have more heart problems oh, and a lot of other airlines refuse to carry them. United is the only one. So of course, that skews then the number because these pets being a more at risk, they might die. Thus, United has more. And again, it's very limited lumber and let's not exaggerate. So, But that's an interesting bit because... I didn't know that I was comparing Apple to oranges. So, well, another redeem quality for United. If you do accept like pets that other airlines refuse, well, good for you. Uh, that's interesting. I had no idea, to, to be honest. I had not even ideas that they were like restriction on races and et cetera. I had like maybe like peacocks. I thought they were. <laughs> right, right. yeah. <laughs> and a lot of airlines actually, I think, have followed suit on, the, on clamping down on these emotional support animals as well, which is interesting to see. Well, usually my support animal is called Haddock's Hunter. So they, you're accept- <laughs> Mine's <laughs> called Champagne. Uh, yeah, when you go to the x-ray. No, of course, yeah. it's not liquid. This is my support animal. <laughs> Also, in the U.S., uh, the pictures of the refurb TWA hotel at yeah. JFK look really fantastic, right? The, it, it is. And we've talked about this ad nauseum on the show that I'm so happy that they've, A, kept this structure. Because I think now it's a list, the equivalent of a listed building in the U.S. But they've made the hotel itself uh, very deferential to the architecture of the main iconic terminal, but also the rest of JFK. And Yes, JFK is a hodgepodge, but there there is a lot of it that's that is iconic, and it seems like this has been really well done. 
I don't have any plans to go to New York anytime soon, but I'm excited to see this and stay in this hotel. Yeah, actually, that would be my first step. Would I would consider actually staying near JFK because otherwise it would just you know go to Manhattan yeah. or Brooklyn. But yeah, definitely. Like you said, not only they kept the kind of the philosophy of the design of Erosarian, but also simply the, the fixtures, you know, the clocks and yeah. the telephones, and they have this kind of retro feel with them. So that really looks amazing. It's great. Um, I cannot wait to see that. And I'm so impressed that they maintain that that sense of era and design as well. I was really thinking they will either tear it down or keep it closer. They would not do that. So it's a kudos to, to or them. Or done and something I really, really kind of half-assed with it. <laughs> yeah, like you know? a... Like another business hotel where it has like just, you know, that's it. Yeah. You know, like just happens to be in a cool building. The other thing that we said in the last episode that was a success and a surprise to uh, the guys who did it, it was uh, the auction of uh, all the memorabilia of uh, the Terminal 1 yeah. at Heathrow. It, it actually was quite a success. To give you some examples, there was a short length of a red velvet rope, you know, these kind of things you use for VIP sections <laughs> that was sold for 900 quid. That's weird. That's just for a velvet rope. Uh, the sign gate 7 went for, uh, I think, almost uh, 1000 500. Wow. Funnily enough, there were air travel signs and first class went for more than business class, which went for more than economy. <laughs> <laughs> you cannot escape the upsell. <laughs> and they were like also our rivals. I think our rivals went for more than departure. I'm not entirely sure. But they also you know, sold conveyor belts, like checking counters. I don't know to whom, so I don't know if they were that's, other that's airports. That's what I want to know. Yeah, I mean, I, me too. But a lot of it, if you look, because it was an open auction, there was no reserve price because they said – they had no idea of the impact it could have and whether people will actually show up and whether this will sell. Well, they haven't been really knee deep in the AV geek world. Yeah. And Chris, by the way, I'm going to stick with AV geek. I don't know if it's AV geek or AV geek, but I don't care. <laughs> <I'm gonna> stick, <laughs> because Chris on Twitter told him, help Paul decide if it's AV geek or AV geek. I don't know. I still don't know. Yeah, but I I'm don't gonna know either. Do. Out of, out of habit, I'm going to say AV Geek. So yeah, and it was actually a very big success. Really cool. I, I didn't buy anything, but um, you can see behind me, Alex, I would have like this big fat, I don't know, like yeah, lost, you have a, lost luggage. You or have something. a perfect space on the wall behind you for something reasonably chunky. <laughs> I know all our listeners know our love for Japan and your newfound love for Japan, actually. And and probably one of the reasons you're so in love with Japan is uh, the toilets. You know, those famous Toto oh, toilets, yeah. you, warm water and they sing and they're, you know, they're... they're <laughs> <laughs> You'll be very happy to learn that Zodiac, and we sometimes criticize Zodiac for being late on delivering seats, but Zodiac has unveiled a bidet for <laughs> lavatories, which has front and back warm water. Jeez. I'm not, I'm, <laughs> I'm not entirely surprised. Obviously, there's a market for that. I mean, you go to, I think it's the third floor of Yodabashi Camera in Akihabara, and it's just all <laughs> robotic toilets. So I'm not surprised that there's somebody's figured out how to do this. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's probably one of the things that is the most Instagram when people go for the first time in Japan, especially the panel, because I am when guilty it's only, of that. <laughs> exactly. Well, I did that too, right, when I moved there, because the first time you see the panel and if it's not translated, now it starts to be translated. There's a start and a stop or something. But yeah. back then I was like, what does that do? And yeah. you're like, should oh, I no, do there's it? there's water everywhere. <laughs> My kids, I, I, I finally figured out why most Japanese bathrooms are, are sort of are wet rooms by design. Because, yeah, my kids my kids in a, in a robot toilet is just, just asking for trouble. <laughs> so you're not going to install one home anytime no, soon? No, unless then. <laughs> I install a wet room, which, again, is another Japanese trend. And I can't figure out why it hasn't come everywhere else. Well, they're, they're very, very expensive, though, right? I think it's, it goes like for $3,000 in the U.S., one of these. I mean, probably the state-of-the-art which is strange to talk about state of the art state toilets. Of the art toilet, but, yeah. <laughs> but anyway, so Zodiac, you could find that in planes. I'm probably sure it's not going to be an economy. It's probably going to be the pointy end of the cabin. If it I don't actually know. ever you happens. I don't know. Yeah. I, I'm amazed because I know that, and this may be an urban legend, but it came from a strong source in the 90s that Boeing re engineered the toilet lid in. I, was it the 747 or the 777 to close quietly at the request oh. of some of the Japanese airlines as opposed to slamming down uh, oh. but that it would it would be a Christian because so I think that you know there's precedent there 
Well, in Japan, not everywhere, but you'd have music playing or fake noise of water flowing when you do your business. So again, to like some type of like a privacy bubble or something. Right, right. I remember that the toilets in a lavatories are very cool, but not to that extent of having music playing or right, you know, right. stuff, stuff like that, <laughs> to be honest. I need to fly them again. I, I was looking at it because I might be going to to Japan in, in June, and I was looking at it. I mean, I love them, but they're way too expensive yeah. compared to what you can find elsewhere. I mean, obviously, um, sad. Um, I don't know, however, if they will go there, because in the last week's Amberg Passenger Expo, what's the name of it? The, uh, the Oh, yeah, aviation. yeah, no, I know, where they roll out all of the, uh, the new cabin enhancement products and all that stuff. Urinals. There oh, are gosh. there is a urinal proposal now. I, I I'm not sure if that ever that would fly. That sounds just messy. <laughs> well, there is. I mean, ladies do not ever go to uh, a bar in the men's bathroom because it's you know actually I'm a proponent of having mixed bathrooms, so at least it just makes it easier. Like so, please no urinals in place. Though yeah. I'm sure that low cost airlines, some of them simply because of the less space they might take, would be interested. Yeah. Yeah. True. Mm. Uh, so two things that we mentioned in the last episode that I wanted just to quickly go back to uh, one. Remember, we talked about this uh, <laughs> cargo bed thing oh, from yeah, Airbus yeah. and Zodiac. And I've read uh, since after we recorded that uh, because you said, why would airlines, you know, use that space for that instead of simply carrying cargo, which is much more valuable. And I read since then that the... Cargo is actually down for airliner and is up for you know cargo airlines so for the oh, ones that are specific. So maybe maybe Airbus and Zodiac know something there. They realize that there's less cargo in commercial airliners, and they're like maybe we can actually retrofit that space. space. There's also uh, interestingly, there's also been I don't remember where I read it. Maybe on one of these flyer talks or something. Someone said that. It wouldn't have to be something that you would pay for and sleep for the whole duration of the flight. It could simply be something that you're in economy and you pay for a one hour nap. You go down, you sleep, and then you go back to your season. It would be like a rolling basis. Interesting I, idea. That sounds like a lot of administration, but it's definitely – I'm interested to see if anyone goes for this. Yeah, me too. I still don't see it, but maybe – honestly, if, if that happens, I'll try it just for the sake of trying. Oh, yeah, I don't like yeah. not having – I mean, I'd like to have a window, but there's no window. But I'd still try to see how it actually feels. I'm really tall. Maybe I'm not going to fit like in most capsule hotels, actually, in Japan. <laughs> <laughs> I'll try them, man. There's a few ones. Next time you go to, to either Osaka or Tokyo, there's a, there's a few ones that are super cool, like super design. And uh, nine hours, one is called. I mean, I'll tell you which one because you really have to try that with Greg and maybe even film. That Greg, that Greg needs be. to have his own capsule, though. <laughs> yeah, for a while. <laughs> Guys, I don't know. <laughs> I'm not commenting on that. <laughs> and the other thing we talked about was uh, Niki Lauda. And I forgot to mention something that it's not exactly relevant to the sale of uh, Lauda Air. I mean, Lauda Motion. Is that yes, Lauda of? Motion. Yeah, well, I think it's the holding company, right? To Ryanair. But the reason I respect Niki Lauda a lot, besides, of course, having created an airline successfully, so sold it and the whole story, is that he's very much involved himself in ways that very few CEOs have ever been. There was this uh, crash in 91 over Thailand when the, one of the reverse thrusters, you know, automatically went on and, of course, the plane dislocated midair. And not only he went to Thailand to survey the site himself, but then when Boeing was refusing to say what could be the cause, he went to Boeing himself and tried, I think, at least 20 times. He actually went into the simulator and tried to reenact what happened. Yes, I and remember hearing about that. And proved to Boeing that it was not Pratt, the engine manufacturer, nor the operators, nor, nor the airline, that Boeing was at fault. And, and Boeing had to admit fault and guilt. And I said, remember. Yeah, well, gosh, I haven't, I haven't heard about that in years, but I remember that. Wow. What dedication for the CEO, the founder of an airline. Of course, he wanted probably also to say that the airline wasn't at yeah, fault. The, the, but to yeah. go, and it shows that he, he knows how to fly. So he flew that thing many times 
to prove to Boeing, guys, the reason it happened was because of fault of design of Boeing aircraft. By the way, guys, don't worry. This has been, of course, completely... Yeah, this was a long uh, time ago. Yeah, redesigned, so that's not going to happen anymore. But, I mean, it's that dedication, it's something that I highly respect. Me too. Uh, it's not like just, you know, a CEO that could be CEO of an airline and the next day is a CEO of, a, I don't know, F&B company and the next day is really someone who has was into aviation and that uh, needed to be said. In the Today I Learned uh, <laughs> <laughs> department, I had no idea. You know, there's a ice hockey ring in Slaw, which uh, for those who don't live in London is not very far from uh, Heathrow. Uh, it's uh, one when you can play hockey. There's not like a lot of hockey going on in the UK, but I have some dedicated fans. And a friend of mine is actually one of them. And he told me that so I wanted to refurbish the hockey ring to make it better, you know, more modern, etc. And they couldn't. Why? If you're afraid of flying, just don't listen to what I'm going to say. But uh, it's because that would be the morgue in case of a crash at Heathrow. Ah, interesting. Because it's cold. Ah. Yeah. <laughs> Someone wow. had to think about that. And I, in a weird way, admire that. Yeah, if suddenly we have like, I don't get, let's say 200 corpses, sadly, I hope it never happens, but we need a place to store them. And that ice rink is probably the best place to do so. And since this one is close enough to Heathrow, that's going to be the one. Huh. Fascinating. It is I fascinating. Had, a great TIL. No <laughs> yeah, no, no, no idea. One last thing uh, about uh, something I said in, in our last episode, our super listener and... Uh, also underrated traveler, Elizabeth, who lives in the U.S. I said that uh, I have the Apple Watch and I was trying App in the Air, which I still love. And she says, yeah, but there's also a complication kayak. And for the sake of completion, yes, kayak also provides a complication that you can, can have in front of your Apple Watch if you are an owner of an Apple Watch. I've tried and it's also very good. I think probably App in the Air is slightly better because it has this kind of countdown to boarding, countdown to landing, countdown to next flight, etc. But Kayak is very potent as well. It works a bit like TripIt. You can simply send uh, uh, okay. your, that was gonna your be my booking question. To, yeah, to Kayak and it creates uh, trips. It's a bit less complete probably than TripIt. But you know what? It's free. It works very well. You get notifications on your phone or on your watch, obviously. Uh, you get emails, uh, gate changes, the usual stuff. Wow. And it works really well on the Apple Watch as well. So for the sake of completion, these are the two app in the air, which, which I still prefer and I use it. And, and Kayak as well works uh, works really well. By the way, we know that we have a lot of uh, Android listeners as well. If there's anything like that on the Android Wear, I think it's called. I think there's a few watches, aren't there, that, that – doesn't the Fitbit run Android? I don't know. Or is that a custom OS? Oh, I don't the know. New, the new one. Mm-hmm. I'm not sure, actually. But there's, you know, Samsung watches and others. So – is there an app that does the same thing? Or maybe Google Trips, whatever the yeah. the Google Alerts. I'd be uh, interested to know. Yeah. Anyway, anyone who has Android, anyone who has loves geek gadgets, let us know and we'll yeah. be happy to talk about it. Since it was very short since we last recorded, I didn't have many flights. Did you fly since last time? Nope. We said at the end of the episode, guys, remember all our flights that are coming up. I had one actually was uh, the one to Athens. We're freaking interview the prime minister on stage. Yeah, man. that, that was, was so cool. <laughs> oh my god, so yeah, cool. That's got a nerve wracking. Even for someone like me, who was used to interview people on stage. It was actually really, but it was really fun. We launched a mega fun, fun of fun for startups in Greece, and he came. It was a surprise, and he said, "Paul, you got to interview him." I'm like, "Okay, no, 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 that was that was fun." But the flights, I went there with Lufthansa. Nothing special to report. The one thing, obviously, is I commuted through Munich. As always, super very efficient. I landed in the new satellite terminal. I already had landed. I think I talked about it probably a year ago. Uh, and I said it was there was no one back then. Now it's actually, I think it's Gates K, if I'm not uh, completely mistaken. Now there's full of people. But although it's an extension, uh, because it's satellite, it's still so very easy to transfer that airport. I did a transfer in about 10 minutes. Wow. The one thing that, and I know I keep repeating it every time I transfer in Germany, their e-gates, so, you know, biometric passport are the best in class. One thing is because they're super fast compared to sometimes, for instance, Ethro, I keep saying that. <laughs> 
The other thing is the design of it is really smart because, and I know I've already said that, but I want to reiterate if anyone at the airport is listening to us, because I think that's a design that should be everywhere. You go in front of the gate, there's a first door. Yes. You scan your passport. If your passport is accepted, that door opens. You get into in front of a second door. That takes a picture of your face, uh, analyzes, you know, compares with the biometric data and lets you in. The good that's thing about that perfect. is that if you either mistakenly think you have a biometric passport and you don't, or if you're for some reason your passport is unreadable, you get bumped off before entering the actual gate. Because otherwise, you see people at Heathrow and other airports that get in and then they're not readable, and then they have to go back, and it you have to that, have someone telling them where to go, and you know, it's just yeah. Especially when there's a limited amount of gates, that's gets frustrating when somebody is you trying to use a passport that is either defective or doesn't even have the chip in the first place, which I think is becoming increasingly rare or isn't an EU citizen or Swiss citizen that just filters out a bunch of the, uh, you know, the, the time, not time wasters. It's not their fault, but you know, no, no, of course not. But that's a pinch point. I suppose design should be helping. Design should be about giving hints to yeah. people where to go. And if it fails because you're in a wrong light, that happens, you know, sometimes One, yeah, you're stressed absolutely. Out. The design should actually be helping you to make you understand that you're in the wrong light and not having to have extra staff and having to go back into a queue. I mean, it happened to me uh, when I went back, actually, when I came back from from Athens. I was, for some reason, usually it goes well, my passport didn't work, and I go back out of that e-gate and then I'm looking around, so, so now what? And at that point, the two staff were busy helping other passengers, uh, you know, scanning their passport. And I said, oh, it should be there on the right. And I, I walk there and I go in front of a counter. And although the counter was free, the person told me, no, this is not the right counter. You should go the other way. <sighs> First of all, I was like, come on. I mean, I'm just right there and you are not a border patrol officer or whatever. But then also because simply the design wasn't telling me where to go. Exactly. You know? And I'm tall, so I can actually be, have an oversight of what I'm supposed <laughs> to do, and I'm still was lost. Uh, anyway, not to cre- heavily criticize Ether here, but I mean, many airports should be thinking about small hints where to go. Uh, Terminal 3 at uh, Narita is very good for that. They put signage, you know, uh, like uh, racetracks on the floor. So That's you, clever. You, you follow a color, basically. And the color always, you simply have to follow a color. So at one point, you don't even think about the color anymore because you get used to it. Your brain imprints that you follow red and red bleeds you somewhere or something. It's, that's the way <laughs> yeah. to do it. Exactly. Absolutely. So talking about uh, design, uh, I'm very happy to report that Athens has improved a lot in terms of security. We, we just happened that we mentioned last time Gatwick and this very long conveyor for security. Yeah, yeah. They've actually installed these now everywhere. So it used to be that Athens had not security at the gate, but security for uh, a bunch of gates. Yeah, yes. you would, yeah. yeah. So now it's actually one security on one side with Schengen and the other security for non-Schengen. And these are very well made. Everything is also e-gates. So uh, you, you show your uh, boarding pass lets you in, you do your security. It's super well done. To be honest, I'm impressed. That's, again, another example of good design. And then you get into duty-free, and then you're free to do whatever you want. Good point for, for Athens. I went to the Lufthansa Lounge, although I was flying back with Swiss. And I, I think I've said that the Lufthansa Lounge at uh, Athens Airport wasn't that great. It's still very, very tiny. It still has, it still shows the wrong thing because, you know, they have a big window, but it shows the parking lot. You're like, okay. Right. <laughs> For people like us, like, I want to see planes. Yeah, I don't want to see a parking lot. <laughs> but hey, you know what? A lounge is, well, I was going to say a lounge is better than nothing, but sometimes it's not. Sometimes yeah. I'd sometimes I'd rather it's... just be out there with a view and a cup of coffee. So for me, uh, mainly when they are to charge my devices, to be honest, the one thing I noticed that is should be almost evident, you know, Greek food is great food. And I'm not saying that because I'm also Greek, but it's, it's great food. And Lufthansa has decided now to have a lot of local Greek food. And that changes the game completely in that lounge because it used to be like, you know, the same sandwich you get in every single lounge in the world. And now you have Greek <laughs> salad and you have it's honestly very tasty and fantastic and for that i'm like kudos guys because nice. that's not hard to do but if you're in a country that has a great you know 
culture, cuisine culture. Why not? You know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So went back with the Swiss, nothing to report again, 320, 321s. Zurich, still, and I know I repeat myself from other episodes, sorry guys, but such a delight to transfer. Uh, Letter gates A needed to go to gates D because that's non Schengen because we live in the UK. I did that in four minutes, including passport control. What? That's yeah, that's insane. You know, I had a, an hour and ten minutes, and we landed five minutes late. And you know, you deplane and you take a little bit of time. And I was not stressed out, but I'm like, I need to go. I don't have time to shop or whatever. Four minutes, literally. I walk fast, so maybe you, you, your mileage may vary, and some people will do it in ten. But I mean, it's amazing, honestly. Whoa. That yeah, is amazing. Uh, one final quirk about my flight, because I realize I'm not all. <laughs> so I was in row one. So I know you also happen sometimes to be in row one. I, uh, do you happen to be in row one also on short haul flights? Or medium, uh, like on 320s? Uh, sometimes. I've actually started to avoid it now because I don't like uh, not being able to have my bag under my seat. Yeah, especially yeah, in yeah. in Club Europe on BA because you ha- they block the middle seat. So uh, I have a, usually have a small bag and I put that underneath the middle seat. Yeah. I get there first, which I always do. <laughs> uh, yeah, me too. And sometimes, like in row one on a on, I don't think BA does this, but a lot of uh, there's a there's a partition, so you don't actually get any more leg room. No, you're absolutely right, and th- it's funny that you mentioned that because I've not always been on row one. Because of the same problem, I'm like, I have my bag, but then it means that I get into this kind of stress mode. Okay, I'm going to get into the plane first, and I'm going to quickly remove the stuff I need while kind of keeping the the thing, the overhead bench for me before anyone else actually comes in, you know, <laughs> because that one, I want the thing to be above right. my head. So yeah, I've uh, not always, but since I'm tall, I still appreciate the leg room. So I have usually a carry-on plus a backpack, which is not very big, on 320s and three. 90s, but not 321s are slightly different. Most of the 320s, the first two overhead bins are very tiny overhead bins compared to the large one, the usual large ones. So they fit one carry on. That's it. Uh, there's one on each side. So I'm really that uh, bastard. I'm sorry, I'm going to call myself that because I arrive and on one side I have my carry on and the other side I have yeah. my, my. And that caused a problem for once because another person came later uh, and she couldn't find a space for her. I felt bad. I'm like, okay, yeah, well, you know, my small backpack is taking all the space. The flight attendant was kind enough to put my backpack in their own, you know, that kind of the cupboard they have. Oh, nice. In front, yeah. But I mean, that's the reason I go very much at first because I love these two tiny <laughs> overhead bins. We can have both my stuff, but I, I basically blocked the entire row one for me in terms of overhead bin space. So I'm that. If you ever fly with me, guys, and there's no space, you know, I'm going to be in the plane. It's, it's, it's my fault. <laughs> uh, and sometimes, you know, because you just mentioned what I try to do, but that's very sneaky though. I'm in row one, and I'm going to pull my bag in the middle seat behind me. I'm going to try oh, yeah. to sneak in basically where row two should have their middle, <laughs> their bag under the seat. <laughs> but I, it doesn't always fly well. Some people are like, why is there a bag there? I'm like, okay, so guys, I'm so sorry. I've done. I, I, so yeah, I understand. You're I, getting I, all I, Paul's strategies here. This is good. Yeah. But that's why I'm also like you. I'm now thinking of... Two, three, four, it's actually fine. If I mean, yeah. if a client pays Club Europe or, you know, business class, whatever, because actually then you're free to do whatever. And by the way, all, none of the flights I took were full cabins. So I every time had the full row for me, even one actually. I'm always surprised. Row one is always free. And it's, I, I know it's a some airlines reserve until the last minute for, you know, like Senator for Lufthansa or Swiss, but still. That's weird. Free. And then you're like, you see like very tall passengers in row three. And I'm like, of course, they're going to move in row one as soon as the boarding is complete is announced. No, they don't. And I'm like, guys, I would, I would be the first one to jump yeah. just for the sake of it's, having a little bit of reg room. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's weird. I, I, I always think that I figured it out, but the general flying public continue to confound me. Mainly yeah, because you, they don't adhere to my weird <laughs> idiosyncrasies. <laughs> <laughs> but maybe, I don't know, you, you'd gather that people that fly business class are usually pretty regular travelers. So you'd think that they would try to snack seats or have their preferred way of traveling. And it seems that most just follow whatever the airline gives them. Uh, yeah. 
A good for us, by the way. Yeah, it is good. It gives us a little bit more uh, the old options. So one piece of news about Swiss that I wanted to mention a long time ago, but I forgot, but since we're talking about Switzerland, uh, Swiss has uh, implemented a very smart auto rebooking tool. I think it's Amadeus that does it, Amadeus IT. So you know what happens when you a flight is canceled or or you're missing your flight and you have to be rebooked to another one. You, you, you go to the counter and it's start like you have a queue. And even if you have some status, you have a queue and people are like, and, and, and you know, they need to do that. Yeah. And now they have this system implemented that was proven to being able to rebook an entire flight in 30 seconds. So it's completely automated. It does it for you. Of course, you can still then go to the counter, which you, but on your app, you'll see immediately which other flights you assess to. You can probably also try to change your seat if there's still seats available. You don't have to talk to 30 seconds for like, it was an A320, so I guess like what, 200 people? They, 30 seconds. It is amazing. Uh, something about it makes me individually uneasy because I'm such a control freak. <laughs> but, but I, you know, and again, I think I'm an outlier here. I, I, want, I want to be able to pick, I want to know everything about the flight that I'm being rebooked on. But I think for the vast majority of people, they don't care as long as they get to their destination reasonably close to when they initially intended to get there. It's amazing that they've been able to do that. I'm pretty sure that that even if you are rebooked, auto-rebook, let's call it that, you can still say, oh, you know, that's not the flight I was expecting. They will still change it for you. But at least that saved them the 99% of the public that will just go to whatever flight they're being given. Uh, so that saves the cues, that saves the headaches, that saves the shouting at in front of someone at the counter. I think it's a good idea because I don't think it precludes really. I don't think it precludes. I mean, some airlines probably one day will say, well, you're not going to have anyone to talk to, just deal with your app. But probably like Swiss and other more traditional carriers, you can still go to the counter and say, okay, you rebooked me there, but actually, can you not do that? And they will probably do it. Just that there will be no one because most of the people would have been rebooked already. Exactly. I think it's- yeah. I, I, again, I think it's it's clever. It's very clever. And it makes total sense as well. So uh, you have a new episode of Mastication Nation up. Is it Mustard? Is that correct? Yes, we, we <laughs> put it out last night. I haven't heard it yet. I'm going to hear it uh, tomorrow when I fly to Singapore. Um, what was K? K was Kale, right? K was Kale. L, of course, was a, the very popular layovers episode. And again, thank you. Thank you for that. But the Mustard episode was one of the first only times where it's okay to say, which is better, British, French, American, or German? <laughs> was, was there? I mean, no, that's people. If you want to know what yeah, go Alex listen thinks, and, go listen you have to listen to Mastication yeah. Nation and tell us what you I'm very what curious, you think. actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. It, yeah, it was fun. It was fun. <laughs> the Swiss Tommy Mustard is my favorite. That, but of course, that, it was. That pops up. <laughs> uh, so the next time you reach K, maybe it's going to be kebab. I don't yes, know. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. So Switzerland, I mean, it's not entirely aviation related, but I had to put it there. It's an old piece of new thing. It was December. There's uh, an owner of a kebab shop, I think in Zurich, that sent a kebab, the first ever kebab to space. He put a kebab on a weather balloon oh, and uh, he, there was a camera, I think a GoPro, and he went to like 124,000 feet no in way. the air. <laughs> it was filmed. The kebab stayed in place. It was so well wrapped. It was good publicity that uh, not a single onion like kind of fell down back to earth. So Switzerland has, has had the uh, first ever kebab in space. <laughs> hey, that's I love it. The, the Swiss space program at its best. <laughs> Uh, oh yeah talking i showed you that i was in athens like i I just told you guys and i was at uh, my flat which of course used to belong to my parents and then my grandparents before that and i was you know kind of removing some of the old uh, stuff that used to belong to my father and mother and i found i found an eye mask from swiss air brand new (laughs) that was so cool yeah like in the packet new Exactly. That was in so a plastic cool. wrapping bag with like little cards which said with our compliments and you see this IMS that is yellow. Yeah, that I was the first thing that struck my it was I, it's very bold coloring. Yeah, very bold because I would remember Swiss being about red and there was a bit of like light brown if I if I remember correctly and of course white, but not any yellow. That's yeah. usually Lufthansa, but it's it's fantastic. I kept it. It's really 
unsealed, you know, <laughs> I could sell it like a, like, I don't know, like a, these early comic books or something, but yeah. I'm still keeping it, obviously. <laughs> so weird. So, <laughs> so cool. Yes. And last bit of news about Swiss, the pictures are on online. Swiss opened a new first lounge. I've never flown first with Swiss. So I cannot know what it was before in Zurich at Zurich airport. So you have to fly first. You have to be Han, you know, Han is 600,000 miles over the course of two years, I think. Yeah, exactly. I mean, uh, guys, I mean, I'm already, I'm going to lose my center status by the end of the year because I'm not going to fly enough. It's 100,000, but 600,000. I mean, God, that's, I, yeah, I can't even comprehend that much travel. One thing that they have besides amazing design, very tasteful, etc., they have a bar with over a hundred grappa. I didn't even know there was a hundred times. <laughs> Man, you know what? We really should do like a video version of layovers when we visit these kind of places yeah. just as an excuse to get in. Guys are going to film just the grappa thing and I'm going to drink <laughs> it in front of you. <laughs> so if anyone is lucky enough to be flying, you know, first Swiss of Tanza and go through Zurich, let us know. Do not maybe try the 100 grappa before you take your flight because I'm not sure it's a good no. mix, but... No. <laughs> But it's, it sounds really cool. One more about Lufthansa before we move to the very big piece of news. Lufthansa basically announced they want to fire a big chunk of their employees. I mean, they don't say fire. They say they offer them, you know, yeah, options. Yeah. You know, the usual. They want to change the mentality. Which, I mean, we know that. We, we talk about it in every episode. The pressure of Norwegians and others is very heavy. But also simply, I think Lufthansa is trying to be a more like the term that everybody uses in the corporate world nowadays. Agile. Agile, Everybody. yeah. <laughs> they say up to 5,000 people or more might be uh, fired to replace them, they say, with more agile people. Again, I don't know if you and me are agile enough. <laughs> I certainly am not. <laughs> One person that was very agile was the Southwest pilot. That was a pretty impressive uh, save first, yeah. but also pretty impressive accident. Yeah, an extraordinary event and, of course, our thoughts are with the family of the of the lady who lost her life on that flight. But I, I think it was unprecedented for so many reasons. One, that it even happened because fatal accidents in the United States are rare. Four billion people had flown between the last one and this one. That's just in a staggering statistic. There was an uncontained engine failure on this 17-year-old 737. Some of the debris from the engine failure penetrated the fuse lock, hit a window and this poor woman she she was hit by a piece of the of the debris right at least the window broke yeah uh, so i don't know if she was hit directly but of course as soon as the window broke there was suction out and she was actually suctioned out but not fully because yeah. other passengers bravely tried to hold her in and actually pulled her back in the blunt trauma was so big that she didn't survive her, her injuries. And again, a freak accident. Yeah. The NTSB says probably a fan blade, because we can see in the picture there's a missing fan blade. Yeah. Uh, so a fan blade out of material fatigue dislocated. But then, and that's the freak part, the coaling, what uh, surrounds, if you wish, guys, the the blades also dislocated and a bit of it probably rebounded on the wing because if you look at where the engine is etc they say probably i mean we'll see the report one day but probably rebounded and hits directly that window i think it was row 15 not that i'm saying that you shouldn't go on row no, 15 no. but really that window just broke fell off open suction and of course the the pilot had to very quickly descent uh, the flight, uh, you know, oxygen max, et cetera. And sadly, she, she passed away. But, uh, I mean, people started freaking out. And, no, oh, I'm never going to fly Southwest again. Come on, guys. No, South give is me very a break. Safe. I mean, again, statistically, like, is I think the first death related to a Southwest flight ever, maybe. Or at least, you know, it, it's such a statistical anomaly as to be bizarre. The FAA has just ordered inspections to jet engines, uh, after that accident, obviously, there was another Southwest similar. I mean, we say similar of the outlook, but again, there's been no full report by the NTSB, so we don't know anything. We're not here to speculate, but there's been a, of course, people linked that to a 2016 also cooling detached and that hit the fuselage that time, no window. Yeah. It doesn't mean that Southwest is worse. It could be a lot of things we're going to learn, but yeah, there was a lot of unluckiness, but the thing that was 
good was not only the reaction of the passengers to try to save that woman, yeah. but clearly the, the crew was super efficient. Everybody said, all the passengers said that the crew was amazing. Of course, the pilot and the co-pilot were also amazing. The, yeah. I mean, the, the ATC conversation between the pilot and Tower uh, is an example of calmness yes. and uh, you know precision. And professionalism. And, my God, it's I mean, the, amazing. The pilot was one of the first female F-18 yes. pilots in, in U.S. military history. So she, you know, she's earned her stripes time and time and time again in, in high pressure situations. And you can, you can tell she uh, is flawless. Not only did she get a, a plane where yeah, the, flawless, the, yeah. the pressure uh, had dropped and there was a big hole in the side of the airplane and there was a passenger who was very badly injured at that point. Just amazing. And again, like you say, the... Passengers were universal in their praise of not just the cabin crew, but the flight deck crew and everybody involved. So, you know, I think Southwest have, have handled this as, as well as they can. She's named uh, Tammy Jo Schultz. We said at the top of the show, uh, more women. I mean, look, there's an example. And you know what? She used to land on aircraft carriers. So, yeah. of course, like you said, like she'd be good at, at, at this. Uh, I think, by the way, I think she, she had to resign from the U.S. Navy because she knew there was like a, some kind of glass ceiling. She would not go. So she said, you know what? I'm going to go in commercial aviation. Her, her, her husband is also a Southwest pilot, I think. Actually. Oh, wow. You know, but amazing. I mean, people said nerve of steel, et cetera. But yeah. I mean, what you'd expect, she was absolutely, absolutely amazing. A few interesting tidbits that I read about this. Uh, first, uh, if you look at a picture of a 737, or if you live in the U.S., basically every single plane is 737, there's a missing window right above the cowling, so right above the, the engine, and that's per design. Mm. It, it is said that if there is objects actually going off the engine, this is the reason they didn't put a window there. So here, again, to that thing I said, they are thinking that it might have been a ricochet that led to an object hitting uh, a window that's way past. Because 15A is almost at the end of the wing compared to that missing window. Right. Well, well, no, but it's interesting that, you know, you why is there a missing window? I never, you know, of course there's maybe cabling and stuff, but the primary decision was because it was above the engine and they wanted, in case there's an accident, they wanted to not have a, a window right there. So wow. that's actually very interesting. I had that no, is interesting. Uh, I, I, I mean, the engines are incredible. Modern engines are designed to not only contain a blade failure, but also ingest the blade yeah. <laughs> safely exactly. without the engine failing. Cat I mean, of course it's going to fail, but it's not going to fail catastrophically, which is incredible. And I, I sent you this, this nugget of trivia that I, I dug up uh, a while ago that, and I'd be interested to hear from any engineers out there because it sounds like it could be true that the CF 680 engine, which is on, I think, the A300 and the 767, but it's a reasonably typical engine. At takeoff speed, the force on each fan blade trying to pull itself from the fan hub is the same weight as the weight of a locomotive, oh my which God. is the forces at play are staggering. And when you think about it in those terms, it's not surprising that stuff like ha that happens, which makes it even more incredible that it is designed to basically never happen. We learned the FAA is studying the SDSB. There was uh, proposed already to have a better look at this type of engine before that accident. But I mean, you know, Southwest maintains airplanes. I think the, the number of cycles since the last shop visit was 15,000, which is totally regular. There's nothing anomalous, at least from the onset here. Uh, we'll learn. You know, if I were in the US, I would not stop flying Southwest because Absolutely they're not. flying altogether. I mean, it's it's really sad, though. I mean, I'm not I'm not here making light of the the event, uh, but that's also one thing about the airline industry. We'll learn, and you know, get a bit better engines, better safety measures. You know, it's it's the most. It's one of these industries. I mean, it's not one of these industries. Actually, the only industry when you learn so much, yeah. and this is why we don't have uh, such accidents happening anymore. I mean, look at just. 20 years ago and now it's, it's just it's incredible just, again kudos to the uh, to the pilots kudos to the crew then the story was of course it was how did we see all these pictures because people take pictures take videos and so we saw a lot of the the damages inside and outside but also there was this guy who bought wi-fi i think it's eight bucks logged in and did a facebook live super stressed out yeah. because you know the plane is 
and people criticize him. You know, I again, you know what? And I don't know what I would have done in a flight. I'm not. I'm not sure we would go on Facebook Live to be very honest with you. But well, so what? I think uh, one of one of the other ancillary pieces of anecdotal evidence of my point about being so militant listening to <laughs> uh, safety videos and cabin crew instructions, and I've talked about this a lot, and I I do skew very extremist on this. Is there was a picture that circulated with. Yeah, uh, you could see rows and rows and rows and rows of people wearing their masks because obviously there'd been decompression, and so the masks dropped down. And almost all of them are wearing it incorrectly; they're wearing it just over their mouth, not their nose. So it's not going to work <laughs> properly <laughs> at all. And this is why people they say every single time the same thing: put it over your mouth and nose and breathe normally. Mouth and nose, mouth and nose. It was and. <laughs> I get they were under, you know, a lot of stress, but they tell you this stuff for a reason. <laughs> You're right. Uh, there were a lot of armchair designers that said they should revamp the design and put like oh, a little kind off. of... Yeah, exactly. I mean, you know what? These masks work the way they are. They don't need, by the way, they give you extra oxygen, of course, and there's a depressurization, but they don't need to be completely sucked to your face. No. So it's totally fine to have that pace. And... One thing that people might not realize, and if you change a total round design, which is very simple, and that's the thing, good design is simple. If you start adding a bit of like a ledge to have your nose or whatever, in that example, it was daylight, there was no fumes, it was, uh, you could understand where you were. Imagine the same situation with the, just the environment I just told you. If you have to start a fiddling, fiddling with the mask, yeah. knowing where the nose fits and et cetera, Probably what happened here, it's a case of, of course, like you said, probably people not listening, but also probably herd mentality because one does that and the next passenger and looks look at him over, and, yeah. and, and you look over and everybody does the same. And, and since the plane was descending, and by the way, it was not free falling because I heard no, some people say free that falling. No, it was controlled descent <laughs> back to where, you know, when it's, it's breathable. <sighs> the old thing about changing the design, no, I think it's actually really fine. You know, I do too. Uh, I do too. Uh, I think. The more we meddle, the more we increase the risk. There's a very good example about that. It's not exactly aviation related, but to say good design is simple. There's a reason that, you know, like emergency exit doors, uh, you know, they have usually a bar that you have to press to open them, right? Yeah. There's a reason the bar goes down and it's a bar because it's said that if people are trapped inside and they're about to get exhausted or to, to faint simply by their body falling on the bar, it opens the door. Yeah. Again, simple design. So that's Clever. the same for this uh, for this thing. I think it's not even considering all the costs it would be to change all the things, but I you, think it works. I'm very yeah. sure that in the next several weeks, you'll see lots of fart sniffing design think pieces coming out <laughs> in pompous magazines about redesigning these, ma you know, with total, uh, we see it all the time when it comes to airline and aviation. Oh, you should just redesign the boarding card to look like this, redesign the interior to look like that, the seats and all that going. But this fundamentally overlooks the practicalities of just about everything in the physical universe. It's easy to not, we're not, that's not what we're doing, but I've seen so many people like shouting back, especially on Twitter, because Twitter is the outrage mechanism in this world yeah. nowadays. I mean, guys, be on absolute hell situation like this when you actually think you're going to die. Maybe it happened to you guys once. You have an accident, so you traumatize a car accident. Let's say a car accident, right? And you someone hit into you. When you need to write down something, you're like, you cannot, or you're like, what, what, what is it? Am yeah. I doing? What is it? Super? You have these kind of your body sometimes reacts in weird ways. I'm not here excusing the mask. I'm just saying that. Until you've actually been in a very high stress situation, yeah. just do not shout at people and, that have made a mistake. No, and we, we've talked about this with seatbelt design and uh, people panicking to get the seatbelt off and why they tell you how you use your seatbelt. And with taking hand luggage off in, in situations like that, it's you never know what you're going to do when you're under duress. Those who know what to do were Tower, ATC, the pilots, the crew. They were all exemplary. And that's another, that's not only for Southwest, but it shows the airline industry knows what it's uh, doing. There's been uh, 
a clipping uh, of two aircraft, a Scoot Boeing uh, Dreamliner and an Airbus 380 that was at Changi, uh, where I'm going uh, later this week. That was uh, a year ago, so in March 2017. And we have the result, and it's just interesting to see that there was a ATC in training and that made several mistakes, one of which will actually indicate the wrong taxiway to turn to. And Hence the clipping. But thank God, again, no injuries, whatever. But of course, the planes didn't have to be written off. But, you know, clearly Still. there's a... Uh, yeah. What was there? I saw this... Uh, nothing to do with, with ATC this time, but this... Uh was it Singapore door that was snapped out in LA? Of yeah, <laughs> the bridge or something. Off the airbridge, just ripped it off. <laughs> oh my god! Poor dispatchers and and crew are just as much as the passengers. Uh, a bit about Air India. Uh, have you ever flown Air India? Uh, no, I haven't. So I've only flown them domestically. Uh, that was a so-so experience, to be very frankly honest with you. There was a. a I think it was, again, a Dreamliner. I think it was international. Was it domestic? I'm not sure now. And there was a, a such turbulences in the flight for about 10 to 15 minutes that the inside window panel came off. Yes. People freaked out. They said, this is the same as Southwest. No, guys, it's not the same. The plane was not like in a duress situation about the crash. No, the no, panel. no. That, <laughs> it's, it's aesthetic and, and also to stop you fiddling with things that are important. So, I, but, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I flew on a Virgin Atlantic flight once, like maybe 10 years ago, if not more. And the panel had started to come away from the top of the window. And oh. I was like, oh, that's a little weird. And so I, I hit the call bell and I asked, because we were still taking off. There was an off-duty flight engineer sitting in the seat opposite me. He's like, hang on a minute, just jump out for a second and get into my seat and strap in. And he just gets in there with his shoulder and shoulder barge is the thing back into place he's like i do that so many times a day you have no idea <laughs> and that actually was very reassuring yeah it is actually a lot of the interior is actually mostly for design purposes like to yeah. hide the cables it's not just panels uh, anyway. yeah, exactly yeah uh so nobody seems to be wanting air india so uh, the government is trying to sell air india uh i think it was indigo you know the, the very uh fast growing company yeah. and very famous in india they, they said, you know what? This is too much of a mess. We're not going to touch too it. Too much of a mess. Yeah, I think <laughs> My yeah, God. no one would want, is wanting to grab at that uh, falling knife. And uh, they just got sued by Elal. That's an interesting story. It's a bit of a politics, obviously. So uh, Israel is not recognized by Saudi Arabia, although they have. They, they talk to each other like in the background, but they're not re officially recognized. So planes are not supposed to fly over Saudi if you go to Israel. Mm. Uh, but the, uh, Saudi just said, it's fine. You, Air India, can actually fly over us and land in Tel Aviv. Uh, and, and Elal says, no. Because, of course, they're going to lose the edge of competition. So they're not only suing the Israel government uh, because they say uh, we should ban them for actually, you know, landing here. Right. But also they're suing Air India. Air India must be like, what? Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Guys, if you're lucky to fly a lot, take a look at the maps. And they're sometimes very different. Yeah. There are some other quirks in the world around that. So, yeah, so Air India is having a lot of trouble. Uh, we should have one day our friend at Blue Code on Twitter because he, I know he's been flying Air India. He goes to India a lot, not only with Air India, by the way, but um, to have some what he thinks about Air India where he yeah, goes, yeah. well, maybe they should simply shut down the airline and start over. I would <laughs> so, love to know what they're yeah. going to do with that. A bit of a train wreck. Back to Japan, ANA. So, it's actually... I don't know. ANA is launching a digital payments business. So it's not a currency. It's not a blockchain thing. They want to offer more stuff to their airline miles users. So uh, basically, they're going avios or something. I don't know. Oh, God. <laughs> but they want to sell real estate. They want to sell insurance. Does this sell... ever end well when airlines get involved in stuff like this? The one thing I will say, though, and you, you see that now that you go to Japan, is that people are very brand loyal and they trust yes. a brand for life. And then ANA is very well recognized and very well loved. And maybe they have a shot there that would not fly anywhere else. Mm. Uh, so, yeah, we'll see. Anyway, the, I'll put the link in the show notes. Whenever the show notes will be back, maybe in 2020 at this rate, because <laughs> I never have the time to actually put them. One little, very little thing, a tip almost uh, for any one of you who's uh, traveling to Southeast Asia. Uber was bought by Grab. 
Yes. Uh, so Grab is the local competitor. It's not as good. Let me uh, go that right out the door. Uh, but the one thing, guys, you have to know is that Grab is localized in every country. The one thing that you guys have to pay attention to is that, sadly, Grab in some countries, I think Thailand is one, it's not in English. That's uh, frustrating, isn't it? That is frustrating. So uh, if any one of you flies there in the near future, tell us... Uh, I mean, Thai is, for me, super cryptic to read, right? I yeah. can't even recognize you, the no, you can't decode it. <laughs> you can't. So back to engines, because that's one that you, you had at heart. You wanted to talk about it, Alex, is the Rolls-Royce engine on Dreamliner's story. Yeah, this is, I cannot believe how long this has been going on for and how much we're not talking about it. To the point of outrage, this is the Trent 1000, which is on the 787. And the reason why I started thinking about it was when I was in Japan last year, there were a bunch of ANA Dreamliners at Haneda parked with their engines covered. And I was like, that's weird. These are pretty new airplanes. And this is just when this problem was really kind of coming into the forefront. It's really starting to affect a lot of airlines who are having to either take these airplanes out of rotation entirely or they're having their ETOPS times drastically reduced. And this is happening to Air New Zealand, Virgin Atlantic, Norwegian, BA. BA is, is less of a problem because they're, they don't have many routes that are affected by the ETOPS restriction. But Air New Zealand is having to take two of their 11 787s out of service to have this address. This is a big deal. Norwegian are having to bring in loads of replacement wet lease airplanes to cover this. LATAM are parking. Dreamliners are sending them up to, to California to have this, this these inspections and service work done. It's endemic and it's affected the fleet. And I still haven't heard about who's going to pay for this. Yeah, you know. that was my question too. Who's paying for this? I, I don't know. I can't find any good information about that. I pro it's probably on a on an airline by airline basis. But the FAA and the EASA, uh, the sister organization in Europe, have put out these very strict airworthiness directives to say, you have to get these fixed because there's pressure compressor blade fatigue and cracking, which it, you know, back to the engine thing could be catastrophic. So th th this is a, a huge, huge problem for a big number of engines and for a very, very large number of airlines. And we don't yeah, seem to be talking about it. Like for an airline like Norwegian, it, it could be catastrophic in terms of, of business because they rely on basically the 737 and the Dreamliner. Interestingly, and I really don't know if it's related, they are upping their 738 on transatlantic routes, which usually are Dreamliners. So is that because they know that they will have to park Dreamliners and repair them? I have no idea. Or maybe simply like a, a decision because out of, of, of capacity. But, you know, I don't know. Like, who's paying? Like, the example that I just gave here. Uh, Norwegian, we know that Norwegian has... Uh, I don't know how it's called, but they have like this platinum package with Boeing, basically. So they, yeah, it's like yeah. when you buy a car extended and they cover warranty. it. Yeah, exactly. Extended warranty, like like the Apple Care Plus or whatever for your phone or something. So in that case, I gather they are basically telling back to Boeing, deal with it and deal with it fast because we are paying for this extra insurance. And probably, since the problem seems to be coming from Rolls-Royce, then Boeing is charging that back to Rolls-Royce. I really don't know. Man. Uh, yeah, and I, I, I don't claim to fully understand this issue, but it seems to suck for Boeing that they are suffering either financially or at least reputationally for this problem because it is inextricably linked with the Dreamliner. But it is a, it's an engine problem. They did not manufacture the engine. Rolls-Royce did. So this, is gonna, this might put Rolls-Royce out of business, frankly. It seems to be very not something that they will go out to tomorrow. That will last for quite yeah. a while before they. Because I don't think that they figured out. out what the problem is or no. what the solution is. No, yikes! But I'm not flying a Dreamliner soon. Actually, it's been a while. I haven't. You know, of course, I fly Emirates. I keep flying like yeah, yeah. whale stuff. You know. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, talking about Emirates, next door, guys, Etihad. Well, the tides have turned, and of course, they turned because of the bad investment they made in Europe, but other other situations as well. They've, they, now they're canceling a lot of routes. They've canceled recently Perth, Edinburgh, San Francisco, Dallas, 
the, the passenger numbers at Abu Dhabi are suffering. It's low by at least 11, 12%. It was already low last quarter by 5 or 6%. Cargo is also down. It seems to me that this airline will be soon up to grabs or something because it, I mean, I keep receiving on, on their newsletter and I keep receiving like super cool prices, but also like packages like come to Abu Dhabi, you can visit, you know, the new Louvre Museum there and they're doing like these extraordinary things. The problem is that when I read what people have experienced for canceled flights, so some passengers that were in Australia, Etihad cancels around one day, and they said, it's over. And then they said, okay, uh, yeah, you were supposed to fly from Perth back to Abu Dhabi. You're going to go to catch a plane in Melbourne. What? Yeah. And, you're like, and there was a story about, I think it was on Flyer Talk, the story of a passenger says, okay, I'm, I think it was first a business class. And I said, no, you're going to have to fly economy in Melbourne. And they said, guys, I've paid for, you know, why, why, why? And I'm here, and again, economy is fine between Perth and Melbourne. It's just that it seems to be handled like they have to cut losses super fast, so they're cutting everywhere they can. That That's uh, the image that Etihad seems to be giving nowadays. That's not good. That's not, that's good. not good. I th- right? Yeah, again, I think this, the, as you say, that, that rapid expansion plus the catastrophic uh, investments in, in Europe have really – and also, you know, we have to remember that they have a new CEO in place who's probably – you know, looking at everything and going, right, here's what we need to do to uh, right the ship, as it were. And this is probably the output of, of that. And the thing is that they have this brand new terminal about to open or something Oof. that has been delayed and delayed and delayed. I mean, with lower passenger counts, I don't know what's going to happen with it. And even if, because that's always been the rumor, if, in, if at some point Emirates acquires them or do a JV or something, yeah. I mean, they have... Dubai International, Al Maktoum, and then just next door, that other big. It just, 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 yeah, there's no way. I don't think. No, no, it's, not even Tim yeah. Clark can solve that one. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, no plans to fly it yet. I really want to see go to see the Louvre though. So, but maybe I'll just fly to Dubai and take a car. Drive there, up, actually. yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Last time I drove, actually, there's a very intense route for rush hour. There's a lot of cars, and my driver, it was a four by four, started driving the desert to overtake all the cars. No I was like, way. "What is going on here?" <laughs> my God, it was amazing. Actually, that's the cool thing when you have a desert because you can busy crisscross everywhere you want. Actually, <laughs> you don't have to stay on the road. Back to design. So from like the plush uh, Middle Eastern carriers to almost standing up seats. Uh, <laughs> You'd Can like we that, just right? Not to put this one to bed forever. <laughs> they look like those. I don't, uh, I'm a big roller coaster fan. Oh, uh, me too. So I they, didn't know that. They, oh, wow. God, I love roller coasters. Yeah. They look like those ones when you're on a standing roller coaster, the sort of bicycle seat thing with the straps that come down over your shoulder and then the floor disappears before you you rock it off. No, 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 no. Come on. Find a better way to run an airline more efficiently. If you this is a joke, and I hope, you know, <laughs> Kendall from Flyer Talk, I want you to chime in on this because or Flyers Rights, forgive me. Uh, because this is, even as far as I'm concerned, this is the last straw. <laughs> don't anybody ever do this. I don't care if it's concept or reality. Do not do this. Actually, it's the second version of the seat that Ryanair was interested in to like back eight years ago or something. So it's, it was also like these kind of straddle seats almost standing up. This one has 23 inch of leg room. Of course, again, you're not fully kind of, seated you kind of almost think yeah. but i mean oh my god i mean first of all uh, the comfort i don't know some people tried it during this the the expo in hamburg and they said yeah well, probably it's fine for an hour i don't know but no. uh, then how what happens if you have of course an emergency can you escape easily i have no clue and what happens if you've got kids or the elderly or do, are they are, you know is this going to be a section of the cabin that fit and able people are, are going to be able to access or have to access? It's so stupid. Ugh, it just makes me angry. You just talked, I'll come back to the CV, you just said fit and able. Was it not what, Thai Airways that started like weighing passengers? Yeah. Like in business one class the, or, or one of the Thai, come, I, can, maybe it was, I think it was Nock. Uh, maybe it was not. I, it was definitely a Thai airline, but I don't know which one it was. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, by the way, when you think about it, back in like the very early days of aviation, they had to do that. They had to actually weigh you and your luggage because they wanted to make sure they had enough fuel to actually do, you know, whatever the route they had to do. But nowadays, it seems a bit like, I think, was it Samoan airline does it? 
Yeah. Or something like that. I, I tend one, to remember that. One of these airlines. Yeah, 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 exactly. One, or something like that. So, so airline does a bit. I mean, it's like, uh, I know, maybe Thai, was it the one that said they're not going to accept kids in business class anymore because they, the seat belts cannot work with kids because uh, they have these see, kind that's of a legit airbag, airbag things. That's a you legit that, reason. Yeah. If you're too s- small because you're a kid and the airbag you know, of course explodes to protect you, yeah, yeah. that could hurt you as a kid. So that's why they're going to refuse kids in business class. I, I think I think I read that something like that. So yeah, maybe Nock was the one that... But again, back to the seats. These are not legal yet. Nobody can install them, right? Uh, okay. I'm going to go back to what uh, o- O'Leary said. Uh, O'Leary was probably a different beast back in 2010. Now he's more rounded you know but he said uh, a plane is just a bloody bus with wings you don't need a seat belt on the london underground you don't need a seat belt on fast trains which are traveling at 120 miles per hour and if they crash you're all dead <clears throat> so there you he go that's, that yeah, was <laughs> that's okay take that <laughs> for what it's worth exactly exactly also the other thing is like if you are kind of standing up wouldn't that mean do you think that the overhead bins would have to shrink because you yeah, would hit your head that's a great point i don't know I don't, I don't want to know. No, I don't want to know. The <laughs> airline that seems to be interested, because the writer hasn't said anything about that one, is an airline in Colombia called Viva Colombia. I think it's uh-huh. ultra low cost. And uh, the CEO, William Shaw, I think, said that he's very interested. And he says, I'm doing everything I can to make people fly standing up. So there you go. That's the airline you're going to avoid, Alex. Dick. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, my God. Uh, and to counter that, wow, which we haven't flown, neither of us. It's the airline no. base in Iceland that does, you know, Europe to the U.S. via Iceland, a bit like Icelander does as well, has just introduced a business class, ah. which I think it's more like a premium economy yeah, type a little of business bit like class. Norwegians. But, you know, good for them because that could also a- appeal to, you know, some business travelers which are looking to save a buck. And again, that route to the U.S. from at least the U.K. is super expensive. So yes. I welcome especially if you're not than- staying on Saturday night and the, in those low-cost carriers, Norwegian, wow, don't have those Saturday night stay rules for the U.S. trips. So there's definitely a market there. Uh, since we're in Iceland, so that on Instagram from a friend of mine, Max Munch, who is a photographer, a German photographer, he, he's an amazing photographer, doing more mostly nature, does also a lot of uh, drone stuff. He goes to all these fantastic places. Oh, wow. I'm more, I'm more of a city guy. Is my mirror, as in, it doesn't never goes into cities. Everything is like the mountains. He goes to like he's invited all over the world actually taking pictures he's he's young i think he's 23 or something super cool guy and he was invited by uh, iceland air because they just received their first uh, 737 uh yes. max yep and he was invited they did a, a flight over iceland so they took off from Reykjavik and did a tour and came back but the one thing that was really cool they had a special beer in the flight in a can no way. the beer was it was written 737 because the beer was a 7.37 alcohol content Damn. <laughs> that was, it, and it looks super cool. And uh, the, I don't think it was actually brewed in Iceland. It was brewed it, probably in Ireland, actually, just for that flight. It will never actually come again. It was super good. They all said it was amazing. Damn, Iceland there. Please do release a beer like that. Yes. This, this is something that for us is amazing to have. Like We can just look it up. I think there was a hashtag Iceland by air. That was the hashtag of the launch of that uh inaugural flight uh so yeah I, yeah I, I echo paul's uh request nay demand to release it to the at least or at least send us some uh and final uh so you said you might be flying an liner soon yes i am going to dublin at the end of the month and i have requested a particular flights that are on city jets rj85s and i am working on a little thing to to pay homage to that airplane but yes i finally get to fly on one <laughs> I I was thinking what was the last time I flew one. I, th- I know Swiss had Air J a hundred, which I for sure flew in the past three four years. I know that Lufthansa has or had Air J's eighty five, but I don't think I've ever flown them, and I've never flown City Jet, which does have them as well. So I'm not sure I've ever flown Air J eighty five. I need to look back at mystery. Uh, for those who don't know what we're talking about, because maybe some people are like, "What the hell are these guys talking about?" Now this is the weird kind of weird looking plane. First of all, we're fans of planes that look a bit different. But this yes. one has like a, a high wing, T tail, four engine, short haul airplane. They're just great looking airplanes and they are 
they're fast disappearing from Bearing. the skies because they yeah. are four engines that are really inefficient or relatively inefficient. But there's something about them that's just so beautiful and elegant and British. And I, I, I'm sure I flew on one as a kid. I just don't recall. So when I saw that I was flying to Dublin, I, I you know, I could have taken BA, uh, an E-Jet or Aer Lingus or Ryanair, but I went out of my way to fly on these. <laughs> I think they're around between like 20 or 15 to 20 years old, all of them in that fleet. And they are retiring them to be replaced with Sukhoi Super Jets. Oh, oh yeah, the Sukhoi. That would also be a one interesting to fly, yeah. actually. I'm not a huge fan. I, I used to, whenever I was flying, they were used on the routes from Lucy to Geneva and sometimes at Heathrow, but very really rarely. The very early flights on the weekend flights because they're smaller capacity than 320s. And uh, I, I used to be like, oh, no, not another liner because it's slower and because it makes more noise. But now, looking back because it's disappearing, I'm like, you know, kind of this nostalgia. And I'm like, okay, actually, you know what? I'd like to fly one more. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm looking forward to the homage. Not yeah, I am going nothing uh, nothing concrete but uh I think yeah, it's, it 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 deserves it. Exactly. So, Taipei, you've been to the airport you said at the top of the show. Yes, I was fortunate enough when you were able to do this to fly in the flight deck from Hong Kong to Taipei and back with my next door neighbor who was a Cathay captain back in the day. And uh yeah, so I flew into the airport and did that turn which was which was fun, but I've never been to Taipei proper. What where were you seated? On the flight deck in the jump seat. Oh my god, I'm jealous. Okay, I can, okay, I'm gonna stop talking to the airport because there you go. Alex had a, of course a better experience. I'm kidding. It was so cool. <laughs> oh wow, that's 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 a long time ago. That's pre nine eleven, right? Obviously. Yeah, well, this was when I was a teenager. So, oh my yeah. god. Oh, I wish we still could do that kind I of know, stuff. Me too, me too. Oh my god. So the airport is uh nice. I'm not going to be overly enthusiastic because although I said at the top of the show, I completely fell in love with Taiwan and Taipei, the airport was not what I'd expected. As in, when you're used to, again, in the region, you have the Hanedas, the Singapore Shangis, the Hong Kong, the Incheons, Shanghai, Beijing uh, is also pretty good. This Taipei, Taiwan International, is used to be called Chiang Kai-shek, but they, you know, because they have this weird relation with mainland yeah. China. They said, we're going to rename it, so we're going to be friends with China again. And it worked, because now uh, China Eastern, China Southern, and North China fly, fly uh, from there. Uh, it's uh, It doesn't seem to have a feeling of grandeur. I mean, I'm not here to say that airports should have a feeling of grandeur. It doesn't have to be in your face. But there are something that is not complete. And that's on the arrival front. So when you arrive, it's, it's, it's efficient, right? You yeah. walk. I was in Terminal 1, uh, but Terminal 1 and 2 are connected. There are two big H's connected to each other. You can actually walk between them. There's a big uh, people mover. That you keep going to gate to gate. And I'll, go, I'll come to that because that part is more interesting on when you leave. But when you land, it's it's okay, but I was expecting more. And here, all people from Taipei are friends. Please do not misread me. It's a good airport, but I was expecting something. It felt a bit also dated in some mm. of its uh, design. But again, very efficient. The only thing that was not efficient at all is immigration. It took me forever to well, clear That's frustrating. Uh, and part of it, it was, again, because of the design. The design is this long tent, if you want. So it's pretty narrow, and when you no, we of course do not describe an airport as a tent, but it, it, it looks nice actually. If you look pictures from above, from drones and etc., it looks super cool. But inside, it's a bit narrow. And uh, immigration, they had to put like these weird cues, you know, like you go left and right and left and right, oh, and yeah, it's yeah, really yeah, yeah. not efficient at all. Cues from residents were as bad, really, seemingly as the cues for for foreigners because actually when once you reach the counter that was super super quick the person was super nice took the passport that was really nothing it was really the maybe not enough counters but also the design of the whole thing left a lot to be desired again here don't do not read that as do not go to the airport but that was a bit like i was expecting more but before i go to my departure there's Two things. One, the, a shame they used to have an aviation museum next to it, but they had to build a taxiway over it. Oh, God. <laughs> so, that, so that, that is, is a shame. All the, the the aircraft that were on display have been transferred to the same region because that's the other thing. 
this airport is not in Taipei. It's a pretty far out from Taipei. It's mm. actually similarly to the discussion we had last week about uh, Incheon, but also something like probably Narita. It's in that idea, slightly closer probably, but still far out because they have another airport, Songshan probably, that was international airport for a while that of course was over capacity. It's very close to the city. You can actually see planes from my hotel. I could actually see the planes departing. It was not close, but now they reopened some international routes, but you will probably be flying to TPE. It's a bit far out. So that museum was displaced a little bit further out of the airport, but I mean, the Unless you're an aviation freak, you would not go out of your way to go to that museum and then to the city or on the other way around. Whereas it used to be right next to the terminals. Again, uh, that's that makes me sad. That's sad. I'm going to go now to the when I left. So first of all, I was stupid. That's my fault. You know, usually check-in counters open three hours before uh, departure time, right? Mm-hmm. And I was flying Emirates. And for some reason... I don't know. I took the you know the chauffeur drive thing. I took it too early. He told me that, and I said, "Yeah, whatever." And I went, and I was four hours early, <laughs> and uh, back terminal one. And I, I went to the counter. I was like, "Where is the counter from Emirates?" I cannot find it. And then I asked him, "Yeah, of course, it's not open." I'm like, "Oh my god!" Uh, so I was stuck. I was stuck in the airport. Stuck uh, in terminal one. There's not a lot to do, but you can find your coffee and, and fine. And I want to give a shout out to uh, Lena. <laughs> she just happened to be sitting next door and we started chatting. She was a German, left home for the first time to surf first in Indonesia, went then to the Philippines, no was way. in Taiwan to surf, to learn how to surf. And I was, was on her way to Australia. But instead, that's, you know, the fascinating thing about low cost. She was flying with AirAsia X from Taipei back to KL and KL to Australia. And I was like, oh my God, 18 hours. But she told me the price, which now I don't remember. I was like, yeah, of course. It was yeah, super oh, cheap. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. I want to give a shout out to her. She's probably going to never listen to this show, but because that made that hour super cool. It was fascinating talking about a different way of traveling because, you know, she was a backpacker and I'm like the kind of business traveler. It's totally yeah, different. That's uh, anyway, cool. so when I left, and that's where I discovered a very good thing about the airport. So the gates. So, you know, immigration was fine. The one thing that is really amazing that I've never seen yet implemented in any other airport, you don't show your passport, you don't show your boarding pass. I put my finger on the finger scanner and they matched it with my finger when I entered and that was it. That's cool. In literally in half a second, a door opens and I was into airside. That's I was like, wow. oh, not even to the future or something. But that was that was that was really cool. And then lounges, everything is fine. I don't want to dwell on that. But the thing that was really cool, they've redecorated some gates. So the C gates, they have a upper level if you want, where you are actually coming through the people mover you just mentioned, and then the actual boarding happens one floor down. Okay, which oh, I see. You know, okay. Yeah. They've decorated every single one of these gates with theme. There was a Hello Kitty interstellar spaceport. <laughs> of course uh, there was. <laughs> there was uh, one was like almost like a DJ booth, uh, dance music and weird futuristic looking chairs. <laughs> and it was one, which would be your favorite, Alex, which completely themed after the airport. There were aircrafts, there were liveries, there were... Ah, it's very, uh, you know, cute. That's the right term, like right. Hello Kitty, I said, but it's so cool. I actually, if I had known that, I would have not stayed in the lounge. I would have gone, visited all the gates to see all the themes they had because I only had, I was really boring. So I only had time. To, I saw the first one, I was like, what is this? So I was like, I'm going to walk a little bit more because I want to know more. And I saw all these gates. So that's super, super, super cool. That is cool. <laughs> that is really, really fantastically cool. I mean, I loved it so much. Um, the other thing that is cool is you, you can go from Terminal 1 to Terminal 2. Again, it's just an extension of it. So you keep on the people move, you keep walking, and you're actually there. They're building a Terminal 3. Uh, it's going to open, I think, in, in, in two years. Um, it was named, I think, best airport of its size. It's like almost uh, 44 million passengers a year two years ago. So it, it, it is an efficient airport. It's just that I think it needs to be a little bit more splash. Maybe yeah, like do yeah. the entire airport like these gates. You're, Hello Kitty all over the place and uh, other themes like this because this is such, such a cool idea. Yeah, absolutely. So there you go. Uh, would I do it for a layover? Yeah, I would do it for a layover and I would stay in the Hello Kitty lounge. <laughs> 
<laughs> that would be weird if you didn't, frankly. <laughs> we said last time that our next flight, so you're flying tonight, is that? Uh, very early tomorrow morning. Oh, and I got okay. screwed by the T3 British Airways anomaly. I booked my parking in my hotel for tonight. Uh, right next to T5. And then, of course, it's one of those rare flights, BA flights, this out of T3. So I had to re- redo all that this morning. I'm glad I noticed now and not tomorrow morning at 6 o'clock. So. <laughs> Actually, my last flight, uh, Luxembourg, was T3. And I'm going to Barcelona. It's T3 as well. Oh. There's quite a few flights, actually. But at least it means deal. you get to use the Cathay Lounge. And where are you going? Uh, Budapest. Oh, nice. That's a great city. Yes, it that's, is. That's a great city. Uh, you're going you're gonna to enjoy that. Uh, so this time, for sure, we don't know we're going to record next. Yeah, I'm knows? flying uh, tomorrow as well, a bit later than Alex, from also Terminal 3, Emirates, but later than you, so I'm not going to see you there, uh, with Emirates uh, to Singapore via Dubai, then Dubai, then back. But I think by the time I'm back... Alex is probably somewhere in Moscow or Monterey or what are the other, other yeah, places I don't, I don't he's going to. Anymore. <laughs> exactly. And, and then, then you come back and I fly again. Uh, so we'll try to do like this one. If we find one day we're both in London and we both have an hour and a half, we'll do a show. The West, please bear with us until the next episode. And uh, happy Hello Kitty flying, Alex. <laughs> Safe travels, guys. <laughs>